when you're trying to determine personal position, which is what I'll do with the recording. Um, first, um, determine, uh, again, So when you're trying to determine personal jurisdiction, which is what we were doing last week, um, typically you will first do a statutory analysis. You're going to see if the long-arm statute applies to your client's claim. Um, then you're going to do the constitutional analysis, which again is just saying, is it fair for Kentucky to force an Ohio resident to come? And do you determine if that's fair by whether or not there is specific jurisdiction, general jurisdiction, quasi in rem, in rem, or tag jurisdiction? So that's essentially what you're doing. It's no more complicated than that. Any questions about what I just said? Please ask. All right, so let's rock and roll then. So um, today, I think, did I pass out? Okay, I did. Um, so today we're going to discuss diversity jurisdiction. So yesterday, you remember, we discussed federal question jurisdiction, um, which involved uh, Section 1331, which again, uh, just says that you can file a case in federal court um, if it deals with a federal statute, like Title VII, or um, the First Amendment, a constitutional um, issue, or a treaty, right? Um, so those three things say, yes, you can file a case in federal court. And that's under federal question. Today, we're discussing the second way you can get a case um, filed in federal court, or it allows you to file a case in federal court, and that's diversity jurisdiction. <coughs> Excuse me. So the constitutional basis um, for diversity jurisdiction um, is found, we're back to Article III, um, Section 2 of the Constitution. Um, it basically provides uh, that the judicial power of the United States shall extend <coughs> Uh, to controversies between citizens of a different state. Um, so again, essentially what it's saying is that the judicial breach federal power can listen to cases involving citizens of different states. So um, the plaintiff and the defendant reside in different states, okay? Their residents are domiciled in different states. Um, so again, Article 3, Section 2 of the Constitution provides that the judicial power um, of the United States shall extend to controversies between citizens of different states. Um, so just like with uh, federal question jurisdiction, on the constitutional basis for, uh, that gives the federal courts power over these types of cases, there's also a statute that's created um, as well, and it's 1332, which makes sense. So 1331 is the statute that applies for federal question, 1332 is the statute that applies for diversity jurisdiction. If you Google those two numbers, 1331 civil procedure, it will come up, um, and you can see the exact reading of that particular statute. <coughs> Excuse me. And so um, what the statute does, it gives a little bit more definition um, in terms of what is required for diversity jurisdiction. Um, so 1332A1 um, essentially says district courts, and I'm reading directly from the statute, um, shall have original jurisdiction of all civil actions when a matter in controversy exceeds the sum or value of $75,000 and the controversy is between citizens of different states. So again, 1332A is Apple one uh, of the U.S. Code states that district courts shall have original jurisdiction of all civil actions when a matter in controversy exceeds the sum or value of $75,000 and, not or, and the controversy is between citizens of different states. Super easy, we like this. Super clear. All right, um, so essentially all that's saying for uh, diversity jurisdiction is plaintiff versus defendant. So plaintiff is a resident of Kentucky, defendant is a resident of Ohio. And the claim, the plaintiff is saying the damages they have is $80,000. So it's over $75,000. So those are the only two requirements. So we've got um, diversity of citizenship, plus amount in controversy. Yes, all right. It's been a while. We don't really have to do math anymore. <laughs> um, so, since those two requirements, um, sorry, does this screen block you all? Okay. Sometimes I try to make it lay down. Other times, they don't protect you all like laying down. Okay. And I'm glad that we made it easier. Okay, we'll do that next time. Okay, so um, you asked yesterday about. Um, what if there's, there's two defendants and they're residents of a different state? So um, that is the complete diversity rule that she was asking about yesterday. So um, essentially, uh, federal jurisdiction requires, uh, diversity jurisdiction requires complete diversity between all plaintiffs and all defendants. In other words, no plaintiff may be from the same state as any defendant, right? Um, and so essentially what the rule means is that every plaintiff must be of, of a diverse citizenship of every defendant. So parties on the same side of the dispute uh, can be co-citizens. So you can have two plaintiffs from the same state, two defendants from the same state. It just means that every party, meaning plaintiff and defendant, must be diverse from each other. So essentially, um, how it works is you have, so we're going to call this complete diversity rule, So we have plaintiff one, plaintiff two, two defendant one, defendant two, and defendant three. Awesome. Um, so plaintiff one is from Kentucky, plaintiff two is from Ohio, um, defendant number one is from Indiana, defendant number two is from Indiana, defendant number uh, three is from Ohio. Um, so there's no complete diversity here because we have a, a two parties, plaintiff number two and defendant number three are both citizens of Ohio. Um, so the, the easiest way to remember, and it sounds very like kindergartenish, but this is what I remember from the law school, is no one on either side of the V can be citizens of the same state. And they kind of make it super easy. Otherwise, it's like overly complicated. It's not that serious. Um, so, um, again, if these people were both Kentucky residents, then we would have complete diversity. It doesn't matter if the co-parties, meaning two plaintiffs and two defendants, are citizens of the same state. It just matters um, if, again, a plaintiff or defendant is a citizen of the same state. So what that means is for diversity jurisdiction purposes, um, you have two requirements. The first is that the parties have to be of uh, different citizenship, right? So um, if you don't have complete diversity, you cannot use diversity jurisdiction. Even if the amount of controversy is over 75000 you can't file your case in federal court. You have to go to state court. So in order for diversity jurisdiction to be your pathway to file your case in federal court, you have to have complete diversity, and the amount of controversy has to be over $75,000. All right, cool. 
Um, so I'm going to talk briefly um, about some of the different sections of 1332 um, diversity jurisdiction before we talk about the Render and the Hertz case. Um, so 1332A um, tells us um, how you determine citizenship. And there's basically seven categories. We're not going to cover them all in CIPRO 1. Um, but I just want you to know again, for future purposes, if you don't take CIPRO, advanced CIPRO, um, that they, it's, it's spelled out in the statute um, how, for instance, you determine citizenship for individuals, how do you determine citizenship for corporations, how do you determine citizenship for um, alien residents, um, how do you determine citizenship for partnerships, for example. Um, so I'm going to give you a couple of um, examples. Um, what's important for you to know for CIPRO 1 is how you determine citizenship for individuals. We kind of already covered that, but you can see there's sometimes overlap. Um, so for individuals, based on 1332A is an apple. Um, citizenship for federal diversity purposes is a party's domicile, right? A domicile is a person's uh, fixed place of abode, is how it's described, coupled with an intention to remain indefinitely. So uh, a person's domicile is their fixed place of abode, coupled with where they intend to remain indefinitely. And you try to, as we saw from our practice assessment, you try to make the argument based on the facts. Um, what's important to remind you is that a person can only have one domicile, but they can have multiple residences, like me. You can have more than one residence, but you can only have one domicile. And again, the difference between resident and domicile is the domicile is where you intend to remain indefinitely. And we know that can get complicated, like I said, people that are by coastal um, commuters. I live in New York, my partner lives in New Jersey, and we commute, and we have residents in both places. It can get complicated, but that's where the judge decides. That's um, what's important for us to know the law make the argument that's beneficial to our client. Um, and so alien residents, um, it's important for you to know, uh, basically um, aliens uh, that are admitted to the U.S. with a permanent resident status um, are deemed to be citizens of the states where they're domiciled. So even if they um, necessarily aren't U.S. citizens, whatever state they're domiciled um, is considered to be their place of residency. Um, I mentioned in the uh, last class, corporations, unlike people, can have two domiciles, right? Um, what we call dual citizenship. Um, a, uh, where they're incorporated, is one place where they can be considered a citizen, or two, where their principal place of business is, where their major operations are. Um, and so um, for corporations, that's great. So you can sue in a federal court either where they're incorporated or where their principal place of business is. That's it. Um, we saw from one case that was represented. Oh, sorry, yes. So instead of complete versus the governor's legal and what corporation can have two, um, so either one of those um, residents can have two different places. Okay, so um, I just want to make sure I understand your question. So for the complete diversity rule for corporations, and what was the last count? And for their two states of domicile, mm -hmm. um, they either one of those can match the plaintiff? Correct. Okay. Yes. Um, did you all understand your question? Okay, just making sure. All right, um, legal representative of a decedent's estate, okay? Legal representative of a decedent's estate. Um, so someone has passed away, you're representing their estate, their estate. Like the poor Amazon plane that just crashed, and I believe uh, the pilot didn't make it, um, you're representing his estate and suing Amazon um, because the plane was defective. Um, then the legal representative of a decedent's estate is deemed to be a citizen of the same state as the pilot, the decedent, for diversity purposes, okay? The person they're representing. Um, and then last but not least, what's important for you to know for civil procedure one um, is that the legal uh, representative or, of instance or someone that's incompetent, um, someone that, um, for instance, has been uh, legally uh, classified as, I'm trying to think of the politically correct way of saying that, I guess incompetent, I don't know how to say that nicely. Um, that essentially they're a citizen of the, um, a legal representative of an infant or incompetent is deemed to be a citizen only of the same state as the infant or incompetent. So it's, it's just like the decedent, whoever you're representing, whatever their particular residence is, which makes sense, um, is, is a citizenship for diversity purposes. Okay, so whoever you're representing, um, even if they're incompetent or an infant, so it's not the parent, it's for the child, which typically would be where the parent lives, but you know there's exceptions to that. Um, so the person that you're representing. Um, in terms of the amount of controversy, we've already covered that, it must exceed $75,000. Um, and I'm going to leave it at that. Um, in CIP Pro 2, um, there, it does get a little more complicated. You can aggregate claims. So like the plaintiff can have two claims, one claim for um, medical malpractice, that's for $30,000, another claim for their injuries, that's $50,000. They can combine or aggregate those claims to meet that $75,000. Um, but there's multiple rules. That's like a very simplistic way of explaining it, but it gets real complicated. Um, but I do want you to know that you can combine claims. I'm not going to test you on that because it's a 2 that John Cross covers. But you can, a plaintiff can combine multiple claims um, to meet that $75,000 in controversy. Um, I also want to make sure I emphasize that the $75,000 controversy, as long as it's a good faith effort that the plaintiff is making that they believe their claims will be in excess of $75,000, they're okay. But what if they go for, it was pretty obvious that it was stretched that the claims were going to be $75,000. And say the plaintiff wins, but the claim really only ended up being $40,000. Um, the federal judge or court will decide whether or not uh, they want to punish the plaintiff because they have this option in place to punish the plaintiff because they don't want people um, exacerbating or overinflating the amount of controversy just to get their case in federal court because they think they're going to have a, a more favorable outcome. So if the judge finds <coughs> that the plaintiff over exaggerate their claims to get their case in federal court, they can force the um, the plaintiff to have to pay for the defendants, for example, their attorney's costs. So there is some, there are some rules in place that to discourage people from lying essentially about this amount of controversy just to get their case in federal court. Um, but again, as long as you make a good faith effort, and, and you can't just say, oh, I want 70, it's going to be seventy-six thousand dollars. You know, you have to show like if it's an auto injury, um, you know, evidentiary basis. You show this is the amount from the um, auto repair shop that shows the amount of damages, like two different quotes to fix my car. These are a copy of my medical bills. Um, it's just that when you start trying to use like pain and suffering, um, those kind of subjective cushiony terms, where the judge will kind of look, look at your little side eye. Um, but as long as you have um, evidence to support the amount of controversy, even if you don't get that total amount, you're pretty much okay. All right. Um, any questions about diversity jurisdiction or federal question before we discuss the render case? All right. Okay. All right, render. We need an attorney for the day. Um, pretty simple case. <coughs> um, oh, so we'll choose from now. Um, attorney. Oh, I hate picking names. Uh, Blue, where are thou? All right, yay. Attorney Blue mm, and attorney. Can I call any already, attorney Corolla? Not yet. All right. Um, I think, what about Ryan? I think I didn't know. You just told me yesterday when I was still here. Yeah, but it's okay. Uh, okay. You had a legitimate reason. Am I being your last name? It's Erica or Madison? Uh, <coughs> slightly. Uh, it's Madison on there, but I got Oh, yeah, you did say that, too. All right.
right, let's get rock and roll. So um, the issue in this particular case, um, the render case, is whether um, diversity jurisdiction exists. Um, either attorney, um, what is the plaintiff contending in this complaint? What are they arguing? Uh, they're arguing for diversity Excellent, excellent. So we know the plaintiff um, is seeking to invoke um, Section 1332A2, um, meaning citizens of a state and citizens um, or subjects of a foreign state. Um, and the alternative the plaintiff sought, again, was to invoke um, 1332A1, they're saying we're citizens of different states. Um, so, Attorney Blue, where do the parties reside in this case? Where is the plaintiff a citizen of where? Um, he is certainly the citizen of California, but he's residing um, in France. He's not a different citizen. And then uh, the other, the Finland Corporation, the principal place of business is New York. Awesome, great job. So, I have to be honest with you. Um, you didn't jump in when I asked the first question, and you looked down. I was like, oh, no, he's not prepared, and I still don't want to be a jerk today, but you told me. Uh, we totally are prepared, and I'm happy about that. All right, so um, the parties, this is kind of an interesting case, okay? Where do they reside? Plaintiff, as he said, I'm just saying it louder from the other side. Um, he's a citizen of the U.S., he says, um, but he's residing in France. Interesting. Um, the two individual defendants are residents of the state of New York, and then we have the corporate defendant um, as their principal place of business in New York. Um, so what are the plaintiff's contacts? Um, attorney, I still don't want to put your name. McCard. No, you should. No, 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 you shouldn't. McCard. You should make people say your name right. All right. Where are you from originally? All right, uh, what are the plaintiff's contacts with the state of California, please? Um, so he was raised and educated in California. He has a California law license. There's a law office that he visits at least four times a year. Um, he has a California driver's license. <laughs> he still is doing business there. Um, I think it says two times. Um, and he has not given up the idea of returning to California, and he considers it his own home. Okay, so um, it sounds like me, right? He's kind of being shady. Remember, I was like, oh, I don't live in Kentucky. I got an Illinois license up until last month. Um, these are kind of like, apparently, the case being filed in federal court. I don't know how successful he's going to be with this. Um, a lot of contact in California. So um, the court goes on to talk about what's required for jurisdiction um, under 1332A2, meaning when you have a U.S. citizen um, and a foreign citizen. Um, and the court essentially says what, um, and take your time, Attorney Blue, about um, that although the defendants are citizens of the state of New York, for jurisdictional purposes, what do they say we should look at? Um, it basically says that what the plaintiff was saying is this factual submission is not sufficient to demonstrate a California domicile. And it says it like the details about what, what is doing in France as well. And then, um, are you like asking what the court said that we should look at? No, that's perfect. That's great. All right, so um, the court says that both defendants, again, are citizens of the state of New York. Um, for jurisdiction to exist under 1332A2, um, plaintiff would need to be a citizen of a foreign state, not merely a resident, um, and the complaint itself alleges the plaintiff is a citizen of the U.S., so the plaintiff basically would need to be a citizen of France and not reside there. And he's saying he's a citizen of France, but really um, he's a U.S. citizen, right? Um, so the court then goes on to talk about um, subsection 13A1, um, um, and this section would allow um, a citizen, <coughs> excuse me, of California to invoke uh, jurisdiction, diversity jurisdiction, in a suit against a citizen of New York, which makes sense. Um, a person is a citizen of a state of the U.S., again, if he's a citizen of the U.S., and domiciled in the state in question. So again, he needed not to be, he needed to be domiciled there. So basically, um, the plaintiff would need to be domiciled in California, again, not just um, visiting there, or it can't just be their residence. Um, so remember I said that a domicile is a person's um, fixed place of abode, coupled with the intent to remain there indefinitely. A person, again, can only have one domicile when you have multiple residences. So essentially the court, in this case, um, holding reasoning was what attorney uh, McCarthy. Yes, everybody. Um, they dismissed the case and they said that even though the plaintiff talked about his domicile in California, he didn't assert anything in the claim um, for the jurisdiction on the basis of the California domicile or make a request to amend the complaint. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, so the court says... Um, in this case, that the um, plaintiff, plaintiff's factual submission um, is not sufficient, right, to demonstrate a California domicile or that the plaintiff is a citizen of France. So uh, basically, they said both sections of 1332A1 and 1332A2 are not available. He failed on both accounts. Um, they said the plaintiff's affidavit um, is entirely lacking in information about exactly where he lives, right? Um, what kind of resident he has, whether he has any family in France, uh, or what activities he does in France, despite the discussion of the domicile of the plaintiff's complaint. So the plaintiff is not explicitly stating that there is jurisdiction on the basis of a California domicile. And so the court, as she said, um, dismisses the case um, for lack of subject matter jurisdiction, but what's important is they dismiss it without prejudice. Um, and so if you ever see that in a case where they say without prejudice, it just means, look, you picked the wrong court, you can go file the same case again in the correct court. If they dismiss it with prejudice, it means too bad, too sad, you cannot file the case again. Okay, so when you see without prejudice, they're basically just kind of giving you a little smack on the hand and saying you need to pick the right court. Um, so that's a good thing. Um, so what's important about this case is just remembering um, the importance of A, having complete diversity, uh, B, how domicile is determined um, based on um, Section 1332. Um, when you're bored over the weekend, um, if you want to Google 1332, I mean, it's great. So when you're out of practice, you just say, oh, I need to see there's diversity jurisdiction. Um, it's in a, you know, someone that's incompetent and a foreigner. You're just going to look at that section. It's going to specifically spell out for you, this is what's required. You look at your case facts that the partner gave you, and you're going to tell the partner, yes, we have diversity jurisdiction. We can file this case in federal court. Or no, we cannot. Um, for exam purposes, again, I don't care about Section A2 and all that nonsense. I care about, do you know these two things? Do you know what diversity jurisdiction is? Do you know what the amount of controversy should be? Do you know what complete diversity is? When you take advanced info, they're going to be a little bit more anal, but they'll also let you use your supplement because as attorneys, that's what you do. So it's a waste of my time to have you memorize subparts um, when it's just dumb, when you have the book when you're in practice. But I do need you to know where to look in the book. So I need you to know, okay, I don't know if it's 1332 ABC, but I know to go to 1332 for diversity jurisdiction. I know to go to 1331 for uh, federal question. Um, so as we get closer to exam time, I'll remind you of which, which one of these um, <coughs> codes are important for you to know. Um, but just remember for now, for outlining purposes, I mean, you can, but you don't have to put all those subparts. Um, so if question. you... Um, later on, have a chance to look at. Oh, sorry, I did not see the questions. <laughs> I have an answer for you. Okay, let's just start here and go down the aisle. Okay. So, is this guy in complete limbo as far as for, like, the ability to file in diversity jurisdiction? Does he no, he's just file in state court. Well, but somebody can't do it in federal under. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. So, you're not 
mean, that's, I mean, it's not like you can't get your case decided. You just can't do it in federal court. Courts have limited jurisdiction. So how do you just like fail to mention that he was currently living in France and just submitted all that stuff that he like? Because he obviously lived in California. What time he was not a French citizen? Yeah, so he so could have just not mentioned that France stuff, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then the defendant could have made the argument if they did their due diligence. No, actually, he really he's in France. That's his abode. I mean, his domicile, his intent to remain indefinitely. He's a, he, he has these things where he's accepted a job there. He's married, has a family there. He files his taxes. So you mm -hmm. still can challenge if they want. If they want in the state court, the other side can still say, oh no, there's no subject matter jurisdiction. But he would have been better off doing that. Okay. Absolutely. Great question. Yes. Okay. So does this mean that a person can be a citizen of the United States but not be a citizen of any state? Because they're saying you're a citizen of the state if you are a citizen of the U.S. and domiciled in that state. Yeah, so those so, are two different things. So, yes, you can be a citizen of the United States, but not domiciled in one of the 50 states. Because you're living abroad, and that's where your attention remains indefinitely. Well, is he not a citizen of any specific state, then? If he's not a citizen of California, unless he has come back to For diversity jurisdiction purposes, no, he's not. Okay, but then for other just general... Yeah, he's still a citizen, yeah. So he still um, can enjoy all the benefits we do, like a passport, kind of thing. Where, you know, so he's fine. It's just for deciding if you can have, where you can file your case. It doesn't affect your, your real citizenship. Okay. Domiciled doesn't. Okay, so if, they were, if you were going to file in state court, you would then have to file in New York? Correct. Like New York. Mm -hmm. Great question. Yes. So um, this case doesn't really mention the $75,000. Mm -hmm. If we receive a fact pattern that does not mention it, do we assume that that's already been met? Um, yes, but you shouldn't. It's just an abbreviated case. But yes, so she said if you don't see the amount of controversy, do you assume um, that it's been met? And the answer is yes. Um, it's just that they're just focusing on, you know, it's just the full opinions are very long, but yes. But if, it's, it's, if there wasn't, they would have challenged it. Okay. And so the idea is if someone's trying to make you file your case in federal court, you're going to try to get it kicked out um, by challenging subject matter jurisdiction. You know, I say I'm domiciled in Illinois. You're like bullcrap, just domiciled in Kentucky because the plaintiff is domiciled in Illinois as well, so then we won't have complete diversity and you want the case in federal court. So, and again, I mentioned in the last class the reason you want the case in federal court typically is because you think you're going to have a better advantage like, in the outcome of your case. Um, and so it's just, it's interesting when you think about when you file your case, how many things you have to get passed and not have it dismissed or thrown out. First, you know, the person is challenging, oh, I have a motion to dismiss for lack of personal jurisdiction. Your Honor, they picked the wrong venue. You know, Indiana's a more convenient venue. I have a motion to dismiss for, you know, uh, improper venue. Um, or I want to transfer. I want it in another court. So it shows how solid the plaintiff's initial complaint has to be to withhold, to withstand all those challenges that the defense might make and try to make you try the case in a different court system, in a different location of the state, a different um, venue. Um, so there's a lot of, a lot of twists and turns. So you want to do a very, very solid, good complaint. Um, because every time you refile the case, you have to absorb the cost because your client isn't going to pay for it. It's just not a big use of your time. All right. Let's move forward. Um, the Hertz case. Hertz case. Um, so before we get into the facts of the Hertz case, our last case for the day, yay, um, what was the issue in this case? Um, essentially, it's uh, whether Hertz Corporation had uh, a personal place of business um, in California. Um, the court is telling us which standard to use to make that determination for diversity purposes. So this is a great case because before this, it was really hard trying to figure out where your personal place of business is. So you're Jake, what's it called? Um, J.P. Chase yes. Morgan, right? Mm -hmm. J.P. Morgan, thank you. So um, Jamie Dimon, is, I think he's still their CEO, whatever. So he's based in New York. But they have a huge, huge office in Chicago, um, in LA. And so it can get a little complicated sometimes with these big <laughs> corporations trying to figure out where their principal place of business is. Even Amazon. Amazon, I think they pulled out of New York. Didn't they pull out of New York? Can they come to Louisville and give us all that stuff? Like that. Why? You get same day packages. Like you can order, yeah. order before noon. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need it. I know you scooters are delicious. I'm sorry. Who said the scooters? Yes, I am. Why? I think it destroys like local business and the character of cities. Like people are smart to get them out. Like we don't want Amazon around. Vicky's taking my money. Yeah. I'll be honest about Amazon. So I actually agree with him, and I struggle because sometimes you know you go for the glitter, and and to me it's like so convenient to sit up in my couch and order stuff and have it brought to my door, or even put it in the trunk of my car while I'm in here teaching you. Like that's really freaking cool. But I do see when my parents live in Bloomington, Illinois. So many people are doing online shopping that both malls are shut down, the brick and mortars. They have no mall. I'm like, how could you live here? Like, you don't have a mall. Like, that's strange. Like, I think a high school kid used to hang out at the mall, go watch, you know, go see a movie, walk around, and just not be home. And there's no mall. And, you know, all of the Macy's, everything just closed. And everyone says, oh, it's so big, why order online, I order online. Um, so there is concern to me because those are jobs that are being lost. Um, when I see the airport, I do think it's cool that I can hurry up and I'm going to hurry and use one of those machines. But I also know that those machines used to be employees, then now they don't have to pay health insurance on. You know, they're able to cut costs. And so my concern is that a bigger picture, although I love the glitz and glamour of Amazon and the convenience of the touchscreen uh, kiosk at the airport, I keep thinking eventually. Like so many of our lower level jobs, our blue collar jobs, our unskilled jobs are not going to be available, um, that more people are going to be relying on social services and we're going to just totally tank and belly over, meaning be too bottom heavy. Um, and I don't know, I just feel like it's going to be like, it's going to be really bad. Um, and then you go back to the whole socialist, everybody gets their even share, which my husband and I argue about that all the time. I just kind of mess with him for fun. Because he's like, he says, what motivation would you have? You know, to try, if you know you're going to get a set amount of money, every, like, why am I going to try to excel or create something new? Who cares? What's going to motivate me? That's how who? The Soviet Union. Yeah. No offense to anyone who has family or who is a clean custodian, the general's getting the exact same amount of dentist. And the dentists were sitting there thinking, well, why should I do anything? Why bother? Mm -hmm. But then, maybe for the greater good. That's why you different gets your fair share. So the point is, I don't know how our current capitalist system is going to withstand and be, you know, because we keep outsourcing. Look how many, like, when we call the airlines, it's people in another country, which is fine. But I'm like, there's so many unemployed people here, but they're not skilled. Um, State Farm, when my dad retired from the corporate office, he said half of his department, they outsource uh, the work from India because they honestly couldn't find enough skilled workers in the U.S. in that region. It was just easier to bring people in. Um, and so I just worry about that. So Amazon does concern me, and like, big, like Walmart, because I do like the local. Like, I refuse to go to Starbucks. Just because, I mean, it's overwhelming. Like, I, I almost told you my coffee shop cut myself. Um, <laughs> you don't need to see what I look like outside of this building. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I try to just do the local, so I get it. I get it. I get it. But what do, you, what do we do? Like, it is convenient, but then are we compromising our culture and value? What is it? Dimitri, because you haven't had a chance. Oh, well, I
you can't, you have to sacrifice your moral sword to survive. Yeah. Oh, it's bad. I'm just wondering where we're going. Yes, you, you have, have the answer? No, but we'll get the jobs from somewhere. What happened to all the milk deliverers, the people that delivered ice, the telegraph that. workers, the telegram yeah. workers? Yeah. Somehow just take care of those. Yeah, because yeah, then they had, like, they really need a high school phone to be an air traffic controller. So, so that's a good, that's very optimistic. He's saying other jobs will start to come into play. I just wonder. I just wonder. Oh, well, so we'll see. 20 years from now. Okay. Let's be respectful. Hold on. Yeah, from a historical perspective, this has always been happening. You're always saying. Well, I mean, just even look at a de separate uh, technological revolution that was in the 1800s, 1700s with the Industrial Revolution. Entire families went bankrupt, poor, and hungry because they had a very specific type of skill set. They had to eat learn, they had to, it's always been after dark. It's yeah. just never, it's just never been as jarring as it is now, because usually you always had to have something at least monitor the machine. Now the machine's monitoring the machine, so what's going on? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> okay, so we'll move on, but, um, just because I, like, there's, like, a, a lot of pushback here for online classes because some of the older faculty feel like, I don't want to learn how to do that, um, and they feel like it jeopardizes their jobs because they don't have the technological skills to do it and they don't want to learn it. Um, but I also, like, I know I'm going to be a hologram one day, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> for real, why not? I'm really, they had a hologram at the Boston airport, and I'm, I'm serious, I thought it was a TSA person that was telling you, you know, make sure you don't have liquids, and as I got closer, I did my hand like that, and I was like, oh my god, it's a hologram. But why couldn't you create a hologram that just anticipates, like, there's a, we've caught enough, we know what questions for the most part people are going to ask, and you just respond to the question, it's a hologram. Well, what was the okay. Um, yes, they were, um, actually, you know what, if you send me an email, I'll bring, I'll, I'll send a PDF around. Um, but it ended up being 67% um, in support um, of the online classes. The vote was to increase the number of online offerings of faculty that did vote yes for seminars. So you all will benefit if you choose to. You're not required to take them, but you can take additional classes in the summer or half of your classes in the, in the, during the school year can be online. Um, so they voted yes. But this class, 67%, you kind of want to be the side. for the whole school, but it's totally fine. No pressure. <laughs> yeah. Because um, none of the other faculty surveyed their students, so trust me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> play, play All right. Um, so the facts in this case, we know we have a class action suit. Um, Hertz employees in California allege that Hertz violated California's um, wage and hour law, essentially. Um, Hertz defendant, what they're trying to do in this case um, is they uh, sought to remove the case to federal court, um, invoking diversity jurisdiction. So we haven't covered removal yet, um, but essentially, um, if you think the plaintiff files a case in state court and you think it should be in federal court, it's just like kind of like transfer. You can say, Your Honor, I make a motion to have the court move from this court system to another, so from state court to federal court. We'll spend a class covering that, but that's the quick and down and dirty version. Um, so what did the employees argue in this case, either Attorney um, McCarg or Attorney Blue? What did, why, why did they not want the case transferred? Um, the plaintiff did not want the case transferred to federal court. California is the principal place of business of Hertz. You gave two examples as to why. You know, they derived most of their revenue from the state of California, did all the other states, um, their Hertz business occurred in California, and therefore they're a citizen of California. So they're like, hey, that, that destroys diversity. There's no diversity of citizenship. The case has to stay in state court. We don't want it in federal court. There's no diversity jurisdiction. Um, so the district court concluded that it lacked diversity jurisdiction. They agreed, right, with the plaintiff defendant, because Hertz was a California citizen under the Ninth Circuit precedent, which asked, um, so basically the Ninth Circuit had an existing rule that said um, whether the amount of the corporation's business activity is significantly larger or substantially predominates in one state. That's how you determine. That was the Ninth Circuit rule. So if you're trying to determine corporation citizenship, the Ninth Circuit said what you look at is where they have a significant portion of their business, um, where whatever state is substantially uh, predominate in terms of their presence. Um, so the district court held that California, again, was Hertz's principal place of business, um, therefore no diversity jurisdiction, right? Um, so what is the rule set forth in this case, which is why we read this case, on how to determine um, a corporation's principal place of business? I believe it is located... I'm not writing the page number down. Um, but it tells you somewhere in the case that I thought I wrote the page number down. Uh, okay. The Supreme Court said that it was based on the principal place of business. And that's that's what happened to where corporations offer the right to control the corporation activities. Excellent. So that makes sense, right? You look at where you know where the corporation's high level officers, um, where they coordinate the corporation's activities, where's their hub, right? They call it the nerve center test, okay? Um, the control center. So the nerve center test says that the nerve center of the corporation uh, will typically be found uh, where the corporation's headquarters are principal place of business, as long as it's labeled as a headquarters and not simply an office, uh, for instance, where the corporation uh, holds its board meetings. So again, uh, for factual purposes, you're gonna look at, okay, you're gonna make an argument that their high level officers are located in Ohio. Um, they um, the supervisors report to um, upper level people that are in Ohio. Uh, they coordinate the corporation's activities from Ohio, you know, all their initiatives. So those are the things that you look for. It's not a perfect test, but it's giving you some um, factors to look for when it's not clear where a company's principal place of business is because they have several offices. Um, that's why I mentioned earlier, Jamie Diamond, you're gonna look at where's the CEO located, because typically he's, he or she is in charge and that's gonna be um, where the higher level officers are the rest of the department, whoever's the head, the top, 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 where's Trump at, right? Um, so, um, some of the reasons the court gives uh, for adopting this approach instead of the Ninth Circuit approach, um, they said basically they look at the language of Section 1332A1, um, and they said, you know, if you look at the legislative language, um, we think um, it supports this approach um, that the principal place of business can only be one place. You know, the statute um, doesn't in any way suggest that Congress intended to allow a corporation to have more than one principal place of business. Um, they also said that um, they think adopting this new test um, promotes administrative simplicity um, in contrast to having, you know, these multifaceted tests. They said we don't want to make this overly complicated. Again, look at where the higher level officers are, where they're directing activities from, you know, where the CEO is, et cetera. And then lastly, um, the rationale that the court gave for adopting this more simplicity um, test, meaning the nurse center test, is simply they said, if you look at the legislative history of um, Section 1332, it indicates that there's a preference for a test, again, that's not complex, um, and uh, again, Congress was very clear on not wanting to make this overly um, complicated. Um, the court then goes on to recognize some of the potential issues um, with the nurse center test, so they acknowledge, yes, it has some limitations, right? Um, but they say the benefits outweigh the problem. We want to, again, avoid um, choosing simplicity over uh, a more complex test. 
Um, so with respect to the holding, um, unfortunately your textbook um, edits out the holding. Um, so you usually don't do that of the case. Um, but just so you know, the Supreme Court eventually reverses the district court and the Ninth Circuit and held that based on the facts um, submitted um, by the Hertz Corporation, uh, that Hertz's center of aggression, uh, control, and coordination is nerve center um, and headquarters were located in New Jersey and not California. Okay. Um, so there is diversity subject matter jurisdiction um, for the claim to be heard and removed to federal courts. So that's what the court essentially held. Um, so the important point to take away from this particular case is the test regarding how you determine uh, where corporations' principal place of business is for diversity purposes, and that is simply the nerve center test. Super simple, clear. We like this class because the rules are like right there. You don't have to go and search. I mean, it's great. Got the minimum contact test, got the nerve center test. We like this. Substantial contacts for general jurisdiction. You should be the first class to get all A's. There's no limits. It doesn't hurt me all. It just makes me look really good. Um, <laughs> it does, actually. I'd be like, yeah, my class killed me. Damn, you guys are stuck. Um, so, does anybody have any questions about diversity jurisdiction? Yes. Um, so, what do you do in a situation where the plaintiff is the same place of domicile as like the principal place of business of a corporation or. When you destroy or diversity or jurisdiction, you have no choice but to file in state court. <laughs> Yeah, sucks. But again, it's not denying you an opportunity to hear your case, just denying you the most favorable, potentially most favorable form. So there's a, that's a okay. Great question. Is your hand up? No, you're just doing the way Patrick made. Anybody else? I didn't say your name, so you don't know who you are. I'm not going to look at you, so they don't know who I'm talking to. <laughs> All right. Um, so I know you just wash my eyes. Are we actually getting out early? So I never know. Oh, wow, we are. All right. Great. Um, so don't forget, Monday I got you for class. Tuesday I do need you to read and be prepared. So finish your brief by Monday. Um, and I will see you next week. Have a great week. <laughs> Wait, where did she go? Nine seconds. Yeah. <laughs>